I have really just been wanting to validate for people that everyone is struggling right now. We are living through a collective trauma. And if you are not okay, like nobody is okay. Um, And it's okay to say that. And, And I think to validate that for people that if you're exhausted, if you're anxious, if you're worn out, um, you are not alone. And there's no shame because we're all in it. We're all in this together. You're listening to Becoming Wildly Resilient, brought to you by University of Kentucky Human Resources, Health and Wellness. In this series, we'll explore a variety of well being topics with experts from the university community in physical, emotional, nutritional, and financial health. Join us, and together we'll discover how we can thrive at work, home, and beyond. Welcome to another episode of Becoming Wildly Resilient. For those that don't know, I'm Jacob Hester, and I'm your host. We appreciate you joining us, and if you are joining us for the first time, welcome, and be sure to go back and check out the first five episodes that we have. Joining me for this conversation is Cindy Bowling. She is a licensed clinical social worker with UK HR Work Plus Life Connections Counseling. Today we'll be talking about burnout, what it is, and what we can do to help prevent it or reverse it. So welcome, Cindy. Good morning. So it has been a year to say the least. So first, how are you doing? (laughs) <laughs> well, that's a loaded question that I know we ask everybody and, you know, don't quite know what to say. So mostly I'm OK. Some days, you know, are harder than others. Just trying to, you know, deal with things as they come and make it through. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, because I feel like that's a that's a question. You mentioned it being loaded. That's a question that we <laughs> ask people a lot of times um, in passing. It's like, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? And I feel like now we like, you don't always look for the answer with that, but I feel like now we kind of need to. We need to look for the answer. Yeah. And that's it. For those that have been listening, that's a question that I have not really fully asked any of my guests yet um, either. So I feel like we're kind of reaching this point and we're uh, kind of based on our subject matter today. I felt like it was a good sort of starting point just to see how you're doing and to check in with yourself um, and to check in with us around you too. So Tell the listeners just a little more about yourself and the work that you do. All right. Well, um, like you mentioned before, I'm an LCSW or a licensed clinical social worker. I live and practice here in Lexington and am part of the Work Plus Life Connections team at UK. I also have a private practice and have done lots of things throughout um, my career, but have kind of, as I was thinking about this podcast, I was thinking through what I have done. And I started with really, really young kids and have worked my way up. Now I work with, you know, adolescents and adults. Um, But my private practice has a strong focus on trauma and attachment. Uh, I'm an EMDR clinician. That means it stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So I work with folks mostly on recent or current traumas or, you know, traumas that have occurred over their lifetime and how that relates to attachment and how people, you know, engage with other people in their lives and in the world. So that's kind of what I do. I think you're a good guest for this because we're talking about burnout and we're closing on 2020 now. And like I said, what a year it's been. Um, In the few days before that we recorded this episode, we had some additional guidelines and closures that came from the governor um, as the virus continues to spread. So kind of given that we've been in this for almost nine months now, and there continues to be this need for returning to enhanced measures, the racial and political unrest that we've had across the country over the last few months, plus those normal everyday stressors that we have to deal with, do you sense that we're headed into a second or even a third wave with mental and emotional health, or do you feel like it's kind of been on its own path? You know, I thought about that and um, I kind of think it's been an individual path for, you know, everybody. Um, I think back to eight, nine months ago and where folks were and I see a lot of people in healthcare, And so I think those folks were just kind of they thought they knew what was coming and what the expectations were. And they were kind of just dealing with regular life stuff while other people, you know, may have been struggling more with 
wrapping their brain around um, the virus and things like that. And so I think it's been individual. For some people, it's been a roller coaster. For some, you know, people, it's been steady and kind of climbing with our expectations for what was going to happen. Like, you know, I remember talking with my colleagues like, oh, like we may be gone two weeks or a month, like at the very beginning when, you know, we started working from home and here we are almost nine months later. But now I'm starting to see people be more on the same page with how they're feeling. Just a lot of exhaustion, a lot of fatigue. And can't stress enough about the anticipatory anxiety that people are experiencing, just not knowing what to expect, what's coming, what's, you know, what's happening now, uh, because we've been in this space for a while, but we're still, we've been in a holding pattern. We've been waiting uh, for what's to come next. And that's a hard space to sit in for so long. Absolutely. I feel like that is, that was sort of the reason I asked that question is this, that anticipatory anxiety that you mentioned, this like not really knowing what's going to happen. And we're used to sort of dealing that in some way in, in small chunks, but we've been now dealing with this for three quarters of a year and we still don't know what's coming um, or how quickly these things are going to go away. And we're getting obviously some good news around vaccines and those types of things, but the distribution of those and all of that plays into how quickly this starts to go away. And so that's kind of the sense I had was that it was very individualized for different people. Cause I think about my experience at the beginning I I've kind of felt like I was starting to get sort of burned out. And we'll kind of talk about that here in a few minutes. But the early days of, of the pandemic, I had a lot of change going. I was finishing up my master's while working full time. So that's a time that was really um, pretty stressful for me. And I started to kind of feel myself pulling away. Um, whereas I think about other people who have children who are still dealing with virtual learning and those types of things or those in helping professions, particularly those in, in healthcare and those kind of on the front lines with this um, and the challenges that they deal with, it comes down to kind of what it is you're doing and, and how you're feeling. And I guess sort of how we we recognize those things as well and how we, we take care of each other too. So that's kind of what I want to get out of this conversation as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think this has been a time that, um, you know, most of the time, like you mentioned, like finishing up your master's, those are things that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But, mm -hmm. you know, for most people, like you mentioned, the racial issues that have come up and the unrest related to that, I know that anticipatory anxiety is something that those folks deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. And then to have the pandemic on top of it or political issues on top of it, it's just weighing heavier and heavier on people. And I think it's given other people an opportunity to kind of have less distraction in life because we are home more. We do have like these connections that we can't access and we've been able to explore what that does to us and maybe have some more compassion and understanding for what other people are going through. And like you said, start to take better care of one another. Mm -hmm. Yep. Taking care of ourselves and take care of others. So what do you think are some of the biggest challenges or feelings people are experiencing right now related to mental and emotional health. You kind of touched on them a little bit with the anticipatory anxiety, but are there other trends that you're seeing across the clients, whether that be um, in your role with UK or in your private practice? Um, I've definitely seen, you know, the anticipatory anxiety piece is huge. And I think often people don't recognize that that's what's going on or why they feel on edge all the time or why they feel exhausted a lot of the days or most of the day, every day. Um, but I think beyond that, I, I think a lot of people feel out of control or like they're being controlled. And that's not something that we're used to on this scale or like <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in general in our lives. I think not knowing what they're feeling. I think a lot of people have trouble accessing like what it is that I'm experiencing, especially if they have not struggled with mental or emotional health on a bigger scale. Like they know something's off, but they can't quite put their finger on it. Don't know exactly what they're feeling or why. So that's been a big challenge for folks. Um, and not being able to tolerate that anxiety or the uncertainty or how to grapple with like, where is the control that I can access and, 
and, you know, being angry or upset about, you know, not having more control over day to day life. And I think the biggest thing that I've noticed is just fatigue. This that we're experiencing now is a collective trauma. It's something that we're all going through. Um, It's something that we've never had to manage on this scale before. And the fatigue that comes with that is real. And people are, you know, experiencing brain fog, like not being able to think, not being able to access words. And that is, you know, a trauma response. And I think that is the biggest commonality I've seen with people. The collective trauma that you mentioned, that that kind of makes me think about the the idea of we're all in this together. And I mentioned this on the last episode about, yeah, we're all kind of in in the same waves together, but we're all sort of in different boats as well. And I think some of that early messaging of we're all in this together kind of comes off cheap when it may be somebody who is in a position that is a little bit better. So say they have a a nice big yacht versus somebody who's in a rowboat um, hitting the same waves. They're not going to react to these the same way. So Right, with holes in the bottom. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah, (laughs) You're kind of trying to dump water out as you're actively, it's actively filling up and you're kind of fighting losing battles sometimes. And so that was kind of the point that I I wanted to make in that previous episode was that we, yeah, we are in this together. It is a collective trauma, but some of us are going to experience these things differently. And I think that ties back kind of to that first question I asked you about how some of us may be kind of swinging back and forth. Some of us may be just continually on a gradual upswing. And some of us may have just been dealt a good hand and are kind of holding pretty steady and have found some good ways to cope and those types of things. So yeah, that, that it's it's kind of interesting to to hear the trends and how people are dealing with them and how we respond to them and how we respond to each other as well. Um, and I think that's that's something that especially when you go back to the racial and political unrest as well about how we're how we're dealing with each other um, is is something that we we need to remember because we're we are we had this common humanity and we had this collective trauma and we need to sort of be together um, rather than continuing to drive ourselves apart for whatever issue that may be. Right. So obviously we're now entering the holiday season too, a time of the year that's generally supposed to be about joy and celebration with family and friends. Clearly that's changing a little bit, but even in a quote unquote normal year, we know this time can bring about some stress and overwhelm among some other negative feelings. So with all the stress and the changes to traditions and those types of things, what are some of the biggest concerns with all of this piling up as we finish out the year and head into 2021? Yeah, I think the holidays, you know, are huge for people. And I think, you know, traditionally, if now we're heading into this place where the holidays are going to look different or, you know, everyone is really pressing that they should look different and what does that mean? And you know, what's safe and what isn't. But I also want to acknowledge that for a lot of people, the holidays are hard. That is another level of stress in a different way, because I think if the holidays are as typical and people like them, they do cause stress and overwhelm. And that can lead to those things piling up. But often it's like there's an end to it. There is a payoff to it. Like it seems worth it to people. Um, Like it's something to work for. And then there's this end result of I'm with my family. I'm enjoying this stuff. You know, things are going on. And but for other people who don't enjoy the holidays, you know, some folks that I've seen are like, you know, I'm really happy that things, you know, are shifting because like I may have toxic family members or I may, you know, struggle with travel or I may have anxiety, you know, or trauma around these things. and you know, I think for some folks, it's a relief. And for a lot of people, it's a lot of stress and really trying to figure out um, how to do things safely, like how to connect with people, because it's been so long since we've been able to, you know, for some people, see parents, see grandparents, see adult children who are living in other places. And so I think that continued stress and worry can definitely lead to anxiety, depression, potentially, definitely sadness, and just an overwhelming sense of loss that things are being taken from us. Like deprivation is a big one that I've heard for people that 
we've given up so much and now we can't even have this, that sort of thing. And so I think that level of stress can definitely start to impact people's moods, um, hope for the future, can bring up anger, rage, those kinds of things. So those, I think, are things that I'm definitely concerned about moving into the winter, which could can be hard for people in general because we lose daylight, those kind of things. Um, so I think just the stress and potential uh, mood and emotional health outcomes are some things that I'm on the lookout for and concerned about with the folks I see. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about uh, kind of generally about stress so far and sort of what that may lead to and kind of alluding to burnout. But before we really dive into burnout specifically, let's talk a little bit about stress since that is something that we all face. It's part of the human experience. So can you generally describe and define both stress and burnout? Sure. Um, so I think about stress as kind of our body's experience of challenges that we face, whether it be at work, whether it be at home, just living in the world. So it's our response, an emotional or physical tension in our body in response to things that are happening. And I think we need to pull out like stress that we experience versus stressors, things that cause stress in our lives. Like those are different things. Um, but stress in general, I think, is that emotional or physical reaction to things that are happening. Um, and when I think about burnout, I think um, that that is defined more around like emotional, physical and mental exhaustion that's caused by prolonged or chronic stress. So that can look like emotional exhaustion, like a decreased sense of purpose or feeling accomplished or like you're doing any good or anything that you do in the world is matters or is worth it. And kind of a loss of caring or caring about yourself, caring about others, caring about how or why you do things and general compassion. So I think those for me are the differences in those two things. Yeah, kind of the the difference between too much versus you don't have enough anymore to deal oh, sure. with whatever that is. Yeah. Um, so that I feel like that's a kind of a good, easy way to summarize the difference between stress and the state of burnout. Right. So with most people fairly familiar with the negative effects of stress, um, particularly like on our bodies, what about any positives? Um, so I think there are, you know, positives because if we think about work or challenging things, we should be stressed. Like there are certain things that we should be stressed about and to acknowledge that stress is natural. So I think some of the positives can that come from it, you know, on a very basic level, it helps us respond to danger. Like whether it's, it's like that lizard brain part of us that we need ourselves to stay safe and be safe. And so I think Stre experiencing stress like signals us to be like, oh, pay attention, like something's mm -hmm. going on here. I think also it can help motivate us. I know for sure, like stress helps me meet deadlines mm -hmm. and things like that. So I think that that can definitely be something that is a positive from it. And when I thought about it, I really think that stress kind of keeps us curious and engaged with people and interested in knowing more about why we're responding certain ways, um, engaged with learning more about people, because I think the hardest times or hardest things in our life help us grow. And so I think stress can add and help with just learning. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing that you brought up about being more curious and engaged and, and learning from stress, too. And I think that's a lot of what this podcast is about, too, is helping people sort of see some of the brighter sides of some of these traditionally negative things that we experience um, and deal with on a day to day basis as well. So when does stress become too much? When do we kind of end up in this full body burnout experience? You know, I think it's really that's another kind of individual thing, like when stress starts to impact how we feel about ourselves. You know, I think it can go in stages. There are stages of burnout and the beginnings of those are you're still feeling good and um, can move through things, but maybe your mood is impacted a little bit or you feel the need to kind of withdraw 
sometimes at the end of the day, just to kind of get your bearings back or you start dreading work or going into work or dreading seeing certain people um, because those things create stressors in your life or things like that. And so I think when it starts to be too much, it's the inability to kind of move through things, to take care of yourself, to feel good about what you're doing. Remember like why you're doing what you're doing. I think that starts to move into the area of starting to go into burnout. And when you're talking about the the stages to it, are these like clinical definitions of stages or are these things that um, are sort of individualized to people where it, it could happen in different at maybe a different order or um, at different time frames or something like that? Well, when I think about the stages of burnout, so from what I know, most of the work around burnout has been done around job, you know, burnout, mm-hmm. but there is relationship burnout. You know, there's definitely in my work, I see a lot of attachment based, like familial burnout, um, really struggling to transition from adolescence to adulthood. And if there's toxicity in the family, like really being recognizing um, signs that you have been burnt out. And once you're out of that situation, like it's hard to come back into it or figure out how to navigate that. But as far as the stages of burnout, you know, it, it kind of starts with the physical, mental and emotionally just kind of done. And it's hard to re re-engage with those in those arenas, with those people, things like that, then the more that the stress is chronic, it starts to go to a place of really feeling shame about yourself, doubt in yourself. That's when we move into that imposter syndrome kind of place, Um, really feeling like you're not being effective, you're not making a difference. What you do in work, in your relationships, in your family doesn't matter. And I think next comes just We talked about that uh, lack of empathy or compassion for other people, just taking on a cynicism, kind of depersonalizing. So depersonalization is part of that. And that is more of a clinical definition that means to me, like your emotions and what's happening around you aren't real. And I think when you start to feel that way, you have a harder time engaging with people, having compassion for other people, um, practicing empathy where you're able to step in their shoes and not take things as personally. And then I think once you move beyond that, like you're in crisis, then you start to have, you know, physical health problems because all those chronic stressors impact your physiological body functions. You know, it could affect your blood pressure. It it could affect like gastrointestinal issues, you know, those kinds of things. And I think at that point, you're more at risk of being like labeled with a physical illness and things like that, or a mental health or emotional illness and not being recognizing that it's falling into, this is because of burnout. Like it's falling into that category. So I think that's more of a crisis stage when it gets to that point. Yeah. You brought up a lot of really good points there. And I actually want to break these down a little bit into some individual questions too. So what kind of just starting back at the top a little bit, what Mm -hmm. does burnout really look like for people? So what are those signs of burnout if we're trying to recognize them in ourselves or in someone else? So I think that it begins kind of with being done, like just really struggling, you know, whether it's at work, showing up at work. If you're thinking about somebody who typically was positive, you know, able to come in, do all the things. Like if you notice, like they're just getting things squeaking in under the timeline and then maybe they start to be late or things like that, or just a general, like really not feeling good about the work, really not feeling good about the role that they may play with colleagues or with their family or with friends. Um, So I think those can be some really early signs that we may miss and just kind of blow off as, a stress response or, Mm -hmm. you know, something's going on. So there's an end to it and we're just going to let them do them and just move on, things like that. So I think those could be some signs from other people. I think that 
in the early stages, it's not necessarily a constant state. It does ebb and flow. But I think the more we move down into chronic stress, um, and I think about this pandemic, like I think people are moving to a place of like stress has been constant or, you know, the unknown, the unknown has been constant. And that may be moving more to a place of really feeling like, is there hope? Does it matter what I do? Am I affecting any change or any good in this life at all? Those kind of things. That's when it gets to kind of a problematic and. Um, crisis point. I, I'm a pretty visual person in thinking about what burnout looks like. And I, I'm going to do this again. I made a movie reference in the last episode. I'm, okay. I'm going <laughs> to make one right now. But I feel like, have you seen the movie Office Space? Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> I feel like that it, it, Peter, the kind of main character in that movie, is sort of the prototypical look at burnout. You can kind of see it in the beginnings of the movie when they talk about a case of the Mondays. And so yeah. they're all sort of brushing it off. They see him as it's just, oh, he's got a case of the Mondays. And I mean, he get, it gets mentioned to him a few times in the first you know, few minutes of the movie, really. Um, and then he continues down this path and he goes to see a hypnotherapist. And um, that's when he really starts to exhibit these full on signs of burnout, like you've mentioned, the, the kind of that withdrawal, um, that sort of dread. He talks about going into work as, every day he has to go into work. It's like the worst day of his life. Um, mm -hmm. And he talks about his actions when he goes into the interview with the Bobs, the consultants that come in. And he's talking about how he shows up late. He comes in the back door. He like just stares off for the first hour of work. A lot of these things, like it's put in a humorous manner, but in reality that those are a lot of signs of burnout. And I don't know if that was sort of the intention at the time, or if there was even a whole lot of language around that. Um, cause I know recently there's been a lot of like millennials are the burnout generation, but I've actually recently watched the movie and kind of made that connection. So, um, I feel like that's a, a good visual for people to think about. If you have seen that movie, definitely not recommending you watch that with your kids. Um, right. But, but it, I mean, it is kind of the, the prototypical office movie and, and thinking about those issues of burnout. Um, again, just doing it more in a, in a humorous manner for people to see. Yeah. And I think that humor is a way for people to be able to see that and, you know, then reflect on it and be like, oh, like some people in my office look like that. Some people in my family look like that. But yeah, when you said office space, I just had the image of him wailing on that old school fax machine. <laughs> and I was like, yes. OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think if I'm going to dive even deeper into kind of our discussion about <laughs> stress versus burnout, even um, if you think about the character Samir, who is like one of his friends at work, he shows all those signs of being too stressed um, yeah, but he exactly. hasn't he hasn't really hit that burnout stage yet whereas Peter right. the main character has he's he's gone into burnout at that point yeah he's, he has he's, arrived yeah he's pretty checked out <laughs> um, at that yeah. point but kind of switching back more onto a serious note how do you distinguish burnout from depression because it sounds like a lot of those signs are similar yeah it's true and I think that when you get into a crisis mode it it may be that you are depressed moving through those stages of chronic stress that you have started to take on um, intrusive thoughts or unwanted thoughts about there is no hope. Like I'm not doing anything that affects any change or matters here. And so I think when you people really move to a place of believing that or feeling that way, it can lead to depression. So I think that that moves into that space of, you know, some folks may have physical health stuff that manifests. Some folks may have uh, mental health stuff that manifests. And so I think that it may be stem from burnout, um, but the depression I think is real. And so that, that kind of leads to another good question, actually. What are some of the significant issues that burnout can lead to? It sounds like depression is one of those. Are there any, is there anything else? Yeah, I think, there's any host of things, unfortunately. Uncertainty of the self, really questioning of the self. I mentioned um, before, you know, imposter syndrome that I think everybody has, but, you know, it can increase and really move to where people leave their jobs or leave, you know, certain situations that they feel like that it doesn't matter that they're there in the first place. You know, other things can be, you know, blood pressure issues. Because if we stay at a heightened 
place of stress or chronic stress, then it increases, you know, all those chemicals in our body and blood rushing through faster than is supposed to. So it mm-hmm. might lead to high blood pressure or issues like that. Lots of folks experience like when they think about having to go into work or think about going home and then trying to be what they feel like they need to be or should quote unquote should be like in their family can really have some physiological like GI issues like IBS kind of symptoms, Mm -hmm. those kind of things. So I think lots of people experience that and don't then relate it to it maybe because I'm heading towards or I've arrived at burnout, just thinking of it as, oh, this is just a physical symptom or and not relate it to the stress or stressors that are going on in their life. So now I really want to dive into what we can do. So I want to break this down, uh, actually, probably three different ways. Um, The first being, what can we do to keep from progressing to a state of burnout? So we haven't reached it yet, but we may see the signs um, or maybe see a little of that writing on the wall that we're heading in that direction. We want to prevent or at least slow that process down as best as we can. Mm -hmm. So I think to slow that process down is to recognize those things that what stressors are popping up in your life and how are you managing them? Like I said before, I'm primarily a trauma therapist and I read a study once that says people that experience or witness a traumatic event, if they're able to talk with somebody right after and like bring their physiological response down, like bring their heart rate down, bring their level of fear down, restore kind of feeling safe and like grounded in what's happening, they're less likely to develop PTSD. And so I think like in thinking on a a different scale with stressors, how are you managing those things? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you talking through the stressors? Are you able to problem solve around? Is this something that that's in my control? And if so, let me think about what I can do about it to kind of shift things or make things better for me. So to, you know, to stay curious about what you can do and have an outlet, whether it's, you know, physical exercise or connecting with people or talking to people, friends, family, professional, whatever that looks like, to be able to move through like understanding the feelings that you're having and not just ignoring them and stuffing them down. Yeah, I think it's that importance of self-care again. A big, big theme that has been through nearly every one of these episodes is is pushing that idea of self-care and it being something that we have to continually work on. Again, I'll I'll say this again, it's not just going to get a massage once a month. That's not going to solve it all. Um, Those are nice things to do. And those could be a piece of it. Um, But it is it sort of has to be an everyday or a, a regular practice, at least in some sort of way. And you mentioned different ways to do that, whether that was physical activity, whether that was connecting with other people. Maybe it is something related around mindfulness, whether that's a meditation practice or something like that. These things that give you these outlets that bring that response down. So the stress is obviously putting you in that fight or flight response um, and you're getting these physical reactions that are happening in response to these things. Um, And so you're trying to bring your body back down and helping bring your mind back down as well in the process. For sure. And I think to keep in mind for listeners and everybody in general to keep in mind self-care, those things that we like to do and feel good. But self-care also involves things that sometimes we might not want to do, especially when we're feeling stressed. It's like, oh, if I'm stressed, I need to relax. Hmm, No, like you may need to go to yoga or go for a run or, you know, really talk through things rather than just like compartmentalizing and shelving things and not moving through that in a productive way. So self-care sometimes is stuff that we don't necessarily want to do in the moment, but we know we'll feel better at the end of it. And so I think that leads great into this next question is once we've reached this stage of burnout, what do we do now? Because we're talking about like self-care and maybe getting ourselves to do some of the things we may not want to do, or at least doing those things regularly. What happens when we hit burnout and we're starting to get this idea of kind of withdrawing ourselves and uh, really not feeling like doing anything? What do we do when we hit burnout? 
to think about hitting that place and knowing that if you've hit that place, it is going to be harder to kind of come back from it. And to not that it, you know, not at all is it impossible that we can't do that. Um, but it's just, you know, more of a struggle. It's like if we've fallen deeper into the hole, it's going to take more to climb out of it again. Um, so I think I try and focus on for myself, always trying to find the reason that I'm feeling the way I'm feeling and really address the feeling. Um, because I think it's easy to blame, oh, work is stressing me out. Like I have too much to do, or my kids are stressing me out. Like they, I just can't manage everything, especially right now when so many people are managing school and they're managing, managing their work from home. And it just feels like too much. And it feels like too much because it is too much. Um, Mm -hmm. And so to really acknowledge what can I do? What are these feelings? Um, Okay. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Why? And really accessing the feeling and moving through it, finding a way to move through it, whether it's through those self-care strategies that we talked about before, or maybe it would be helpful to have a professional to talk through things because, you know, there's somebody that's outside your life and can give you feedback that people who are in your life every day and that you have to see again, maybe can't. So having compassion for people, I think is important, especially if they're part of the stress cycle that you're in. Remembering that what's going on isn't, especially if it's work, it's not the person that's doing it. It's not about the person. It's about the feeling or the problem. So identifying what the problem is and figuring out, is there anything that I can do about that um, for myself? So I think compassion is key. I think identifying feelings is key. I think noticing or asking, having somebody, not necessarily an accountability partner, but somebody that can say, um, yeah, I've noticed this about you. Like, you know, I noticed these things happen when you have a bad day at work or these things, you know, were happening. And now you seem like you've get, you've given up to have somebody that can echo those back mm-hmm. to you so that you can kind of find a roadmap. OK, how can I get back to when things were working better for me that are inside your control? Yeah. Kind of mentioning my or my early story with the early days of the pandemic and finishing up my master's while working full time and all of this change is happening. I think that ability to name it mm-hmm. is so powerful. And that's something yeah. that that made a huge difference for me as I spent this sort of couple of weeks, maybe. Um, luckily, it wasn't impacting my job. I was loving what I was doing and the change and the creativity and the things that were coming along with a lot of this change. So it was what I was doing afterwards. So I was very present that sort of eight to five. And then I hit this five o'clock wall and in the weekends and I, I just didn't really want to do anything and I couldn't really name it. Um, I didn't put my I couldn't put my thumb on it. I, I was just it, I had this feeling that just everything was off and I didn't really want to do anything. And I was kind of losing the joy out of some of the things that I did enjoy doing on the weekends. And once I kind of hit this point where we're going to be in this a while, I started to name what was going on and, and feeling that and giving myself some compassion as well, not just to others, um, turning oh, inwards yeah. and Absolutely. giving myself self-compassion made a huge difference to say, you know what, it's it's okay to not be okay. And a lot of people are going through this and people are going to understand. So for me to, to do those two pieces um, and then to look at what can I do. And so I started rearranging how I, how my days were. Um, so I, I would take that time from like five to six o'clock ish and I'd do something for me. So I really love music. So I'd go, I have a, a vintage record player and I would go listen to at least one record from like the five to six o'clock hour every day. And that was something that kind of helped me decompress and get me to where I was. I was back to a better space and I wasn't feeling like I was in that state of burnout. And then that that ability to, you kind of talked about the accountability partner, just being able to show that vulnerability too, I think is really helpful. Um, and that's something I've noticed like within our group, we're willing to tell each other when, we're feeling these certain ways. And we did that some prior to the pandemic, but now it's kind of a regular thing that we do. Um, We feel like we're accountable to each other. 
um, and do that with your friends and, and that sort of thing too. And how helpful that is just to not only name it for yourself, but to tell somebody else so that they have the ability to help you and you're not, you're not closing yourself off. Um, you're, you're kind of leaning into that vulnerability a little bit. And so that you kind of talked personally about how you approach it. That's what really worked for me. And so kind of everything you touched on were things that helped me get from where I was to sort of where I am um, and to hopefully avoid sort of going back to that place as the sun is setting earlier and as it's colder and I'm not outside yeah. as much um, and as things continue to change as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to, I think, labeling it, naming it, you know, saying it out loud, knowing it yourself, saying it to other people, because that's not something necessarily that we're used to doing is super important. And to know like that hour that you gave yourself for music, to know that that is something that resets and recharges you. Mm -hmm. And that's not about like numbing out. It's not about escapism. It's about this is something that feeds me and I need to fall back on that and allow myself that space and to prioritize that and make it as important as your job, as important as engaging with people in your life, in your household, in your friend group, those kind of things, because you need it. So what can we do to support others that may be in a state of burnout? So I talked about kind of us giving that vulnerability, but when we're on the receiving end of that, what can we do um, if we're recognizing these signs or somebody does express that they feel like they're hitting this point of burnout? Yeah, I think that that can be tricky depending on how well we know that person. Like, you know, if supervisors are listening, that can be tricky to bring up to people. But I think being willing to let somebody know that, okay, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I, I fear is happening for you. You know, if you've been in that position before, sharing that vulnerability and allowing them to know, like, that they're not alone. They're not the only person mm -hmm. that's felt this way. And just leaving the door open, you know, if people are open to having you be that accountability person, that's great. But some people may push back against that or not feel like they need it or, you know, get caught up in the shoulds of they should be able to handle it and those kinds of things. And if that happens to just put it out there and leave the door open for people, because I think hopefully they'll come back around and recognize you're somebody who gets it who's willing to hear it, that isn't afraid of it, you know, those kind of things and can be helpful in ways that people don't even recognize how much it helps just to know that that person is willing to sit in the mud with you or hold space for all that stuff. And it sounds like too, when you're in this state of burnout, you're, you're withdrawing yourself, you're, you're sort of putting oh, yourself sure. in this isolation. So I guess if we're on the other side of that and we're looking in towards that person, I think you have to be willing to step up and reach out to that person too, because if they're in that state of burnout, it sounds like the the likelihood of them reaching out to you is pretty slim. Pretty small. Yeah. I think if people are in that crisis phase, then they've taken on that depersonalization. They've taken on that they don't matter or not. Um, they're not a effectual in any way. And so at that point, somebody else needs to say, you know, Hey, I see you, you know, and I'm, I'm here for you. I've been there or I know about this or I can give you some resources if you want them or things like that. So definitely. Yeah. So bringing up resources, that's a, a good kind of segue into sort of our final little section here. So what books or podcasts, websites or any other self-guided resources would you recommend that may add value to listeners' lives? In thinking about the self-care, I think there are some podcasts that I listen to um, Brene Brown is the big mm -hmm. name, but she has um, a podcast that is super accessible to people. Very like much she so. has on authors and great books and just topics, and it's not not so far beyond anybody's reach that it's like I can't understand this or it's not accessible to me or that. So I think that's a good one for just good topics timely topics, timely people that are in the news or are in, you know, this realm of mental and emotional well-being. Um, so I think that that's a good one. And she recently, there's a book on burnout mm -hmm. about completing a, the stress cycle. And I yeah. can't remember the top. I think that might be the title. Yeah, the it's book. burnout, the secret to unlocking the stress cycle. There we go. Um, and 
sisters wrote the book and she recently had them on her podcast. And Great so, episode. Um, it was, yeah, a really good episode. Um, and so I think there are lots of great tips in there. You know, there is a podcast on burnout that I've only listened to a couple of episodes of, but, you know, those resources are out there. And I think as far as if you feel like you're in a space of burnout to really think about what does rejuvenate me, what does make me feel more connected to people, how in this pandemic can I access laughter? Can I access connection? So those resources, I think, are the best and most personal ones that are helpful for people. Oh, that was good. You kind of flipped the script on that one with that question. This is a question <laughs> I ask all the guests and we always have we always have kind of pretty concrete answers of, of what to do. But in this sense of burnout, um, especially when you're talking about something like completing the stress response cycle, uh, that last one there where you're you're talking about finding the things that that really work for for you because it is so individualized um, and it may not be something like it may not be a book about burnout. It may be something that makes you laugh. So it could be a YouTube channel yeah. that you find hilarious or um, to my personal favorite going back to the office. Um, that's if I'm feeling like I am, if I feel like I'm getting burnout, I'll watch a few episodes of the office. And that usually kind of turns me around at least in the short term. Um, right. So yeah, kind of finding those things that work for you. So that was that was skillful there to to turn that question <laughs> around a little bit for the listeners. So if you're listening, find the things that work for you. Ask yourself the same question, but put that little spin instead of the add value to your lives. Put it on there as as what is going to help me recharge. Yeah, because it is very personal. It's very individual. There's no prescription for self care because it's individual to everybody. There are some overarching themes that we know work like we know with anxiety and depression and burnout, like the best thing to move through those things is physical activity. But if that's not something that works for you, I mean, physical activity can look all kinds of ways. If you know that, yeah, I've had a rough day, I need to laugh. It's okay to fall back on those shows that are familiar and make you laugh. And it's not like you have to write the world's next great novel. (laughs) you know, while we're locked up in the house, but (laughs) it's okay to just do what works for you. Absolutely. So what are some of the ways that Work Plus Life Connections supports mental and emotional health for our UK employees, retirees, and their spouses? Yeah. So Work Plus Life Connections is the place where employees, spouses, retirees, um, dependents of employees can come and access mental health treatment if they feel like they want it or need it. Um, There are four of us that work in the office and we are all social workers and we'll provide five free therapy sessions for employees and those renew every fiscal year. Um, So we're there for, you know, it doesn't have to be just about work, just about burnout. It can be about anything. It can be about personal issues, life changes, things like that. We are happy and willing and want to meet with everybody who feels like they could benefit from it. So everybody has their own kind of niche that we all work on. Like, you know, I come from really trauma focused, like I'm going to dig into the feelings, those kind of things. We have somebody, Eric Wilkinson, he has done a lot of training with mindfulness and really falls on that a lot with his practice. Um, Ann Bassoni is um, one of the therapists there. And Rhonda Henry and, you know, each of them have their own take on kind of how they prefer to practice. But we all have resources that we can offer. Um, If we feel like we're not the best fit for you, we'll say, hey, this person may be a better fit, that kind of thing. So, yeah, we're just there to help people in any way that we can. Yeah, I believe you all actually have a page that that shows some of the things that you all specialize in or are most interested in. Um, So we'll link that. Um, plus of the some of the other things that we've talked about in this episode, those will be in the show notes as well. Um, so you'll be able to to easily access those things. And um, if you are seeking out, again, I'll reiterate this: five free appointments per year. Um, you can use those for yourself, for your spouse, or for your dependents as well. Not everything that we do and that we mentioned in these previous episodes has been open to dependents, but this one is. So. I think yeah. that's a, a key thing for me to reiterate there as well for our listeners that work at UK. Finally, then, what's the one thing you hope listeners take away from this conversation? 
I have really just been wanting to validate for people that everyone is struggling right now. Like I mentioned early in the podcast, we are living through a collective trauma. And if you are not okay, like nobody is okay. Um, and it's okay to say that. And, and I think to validate that for people that if you're exhausted, if you're anxious, if you're worn out, um, you are not alone. And with UK employees like that we can do to help just support that. We don't have to fix it, We can, but we can validate and support it. And so I'm hopeful that people will um, reach out for those things and know that there's no shame because we're all in it. We're all in this together. Absolutely. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Cindy. We appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. That'll do it for another episode of Becoming Wildly Resilient. I hope this conversation helped you understand the differences between stress and burnout, as well as how to identify signs of and strategies for preventing or reversing burnout. As I mentioned in the conversation, this time of year is traditionally about joy, celebration, and connection. But even in the best of times, the holiday season can be accompanied with stress, overwhelm, or isolation. And after the year we've had, stress and burnout are probably just two of the many ways you might be feeling. UK Human Resources is here for you. We've gathered our most timely resources in one place to help you navigate the holidays and beyond. So if you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, burned out, depressed or anxious, or lonely or disconnected, then you can visit uky.edu slash hr slash holidays to find practical support and a calming place to land. And if you're not sure where to begin or you just want to learn more, we've got you covered there too. I hope you find some time to relax and recharge this winter break and are able to find the peace and comfort you deserve as we close out the year. And for our employees listening, I'd also like to remind you of the two well-being days that you can use each fiscal year when you need them. Happy holidays and happy new year. Take care of yourself and others and stay well. Thanks for listening to Becoming Wildly Resilient, a podcast series from University of Kentucky Human Resources, Health and Wellness. The UK HR Health and Wellness team, consisting of certified health coaches, fitness experts, registered dietitians, and wellness specialists, offer a wide range of online and in-person programming to University of Kentucky employees, retirees, and their spouses. If you enjoyed this episode, you can listen and subscribe to future episodes wherever you find your podcasts. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching at UKY Wellness. There, you'll find links to episode show notes and more. You can also email healthandwellness at uky.edu with any questions or suggestions for future episode topics. To learn more about well-being benefits offered by University of Kentucky Human Resources, visit www.uky.edu slash hr slash well-being. Live well.